Are there any other questions? What physics typically does is it sets up the equations and then it becomes a math problem. The physics kicks it at the end for the interpretation. So this class gets us to here. So now it's a question of how do you solve it? I have two equations, two unknowns. So therefore, there's a good chance it's solvable. Unfortunately, what makes this more difficult is the fact that we have a sine theta, cosine theta. Theta sort of trapped in with the trig function. So we have to somehow reconcile that. And I can write off the bat, I know that this term here is zero. Let's take a look at the The projectile problem where you don't know the angle here. So the angle theta and shot at 90 meters per second. It's going to drop 30 meters and it's going to land 60 meters from the base. As before, we set up horizontal and vertical. So horizontal and vertical. I have displacement, initial velocity, final velocity, acceleration, and time. I know horizontally it's going to end up 60 meters, so let's make those my positive directions. I'm going to go i hat and j hat uh, using traditional notation, so this is i hat and j hat. So it's 60 meters, it's going to so it's up is positive and it's dropping 30 meters. This is negative 30 meters. My initial velocity horizontally is 90 times the cosine of 90 meters per second times the cosine of theta. And this is 90 meters per second times the sine of theta. My acceleration horizontally is zero meters per second and negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Again, this is the hardest of the projectile motion problems in my opinion. And there are a couple of ways of solving it. So we're basically going to be plugging into that the displacement is equal to initial velocity times time plus one half a t squared. We can use this constant acceleration equation because the acceleration is constant, as is demonstrated right there. So we have the horizontal equation. 60 is equal to 90 times the cosine of theta times time plus one half zero times time squared. That's plugging in the horizontal data. Vertically, we have negative 30 is equal to 90 times the sine of theta times time plus one half, negative 9.8 times time squared. We have two equations, two unknowns. So I'm gonna solve for time in the first equation. I know that this equals zero. And so time is equal to 60 over 90 cosine of theta. Now, since I'm gonna be writing cosine to sine a lot here, I'm just gonna use a, a substitution. So I'm just gonna let C equal the cosine of theta and S equal the sine of theta. Since I'm not putting units over here, there should not be a confusion with, with seconds and we're not really using C for anything at the moment. So plugging that into here, I get negative 30 equals 90 times the sine, times time, which is 60 over 90 C. Again, S for sine and C for cosine, plus minus 4.9 times time squared. So this is 60 over 90 C squared. Now we can simplify some stuff here. I know 60 goes into 90, that's two thirds. And so we end up with negative 30 is equal to 60 S sine over cosine minus, well this is two thirds squared and then the cosine on the bottom. 
so over cosine of the squared. And so 4.9 times 4 is 19.6 over 9, because that's the 3 squared. And this 19.6, that's 4.9 times 2 squared, which is times 4. And so now we have this. So if I want to get it all in terms of cosine, then I'm going to basically solve for sine, square it, because I know that cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. And if you don't believe that or are not experienced with it, take any angle. It doesn't matter which one. Take an angle. Find the cosine square times the sine square, add them together, you'll get one. So I need to get this over to the other side. Again, I'm isolating sine right here, so I need to get everything else to the other side and then strip away the parts. So this becomes negative 30 plus 19.6 over 9c squared equals 60s over c. Then we'll bring it up and hopefully go for a darker marker. So I have 19.6 over 9c squared minus 30 equals 60 sine over cosine. I multiply both sides by cosine over 60. The 60 and the cosine will cancel out on this side, but not over here. So we have 19.6 over 9c squared minus 30 times c over 60 is equal to the sine. If I distribute, I get 19.6 over 540c, because that one of those cosines will cancel out with that, minus c over 2 is equal to sine. Now I square both sides. So I get sine squared on the right, which is 1 minus cosine squared. Again, over here, sine squared would be 1 minus cosine squared if we brought that over. And so I have this whole bit squared, so 19.6 over 540 times the cosine squared minus 2 times this. 19.6 over 540 times cosine times cosine over 2, this one, plus cosine over 2 squared equals 1 minus cosine squared. So now we get, can cancel some stuff out. Uh, that 2 and that 2 cancel out, that cosine and that cosine cancel out. So I have 19.6 over 540c. Uh, let's keep that separate. Squared times 1 over cosine squared minus 19.6 over 540 plus 1 fourth c squared equals 1 minus c squared. So all I did was to square that one and divide it by 2, same as multiplying by a half. So that's where I got the one half C and then square it to get one fourth C. I want to get everything together, so I'm going to bring the one over. I'm going to bring the C squared over. And so I'm left with 19.6 over 540 squared times one over C squared minus subtract one. Uh, so that would be. 559.6 over 540 plus 5 fourths c squared. Uh, I'm basically, when I'm subtracting 1, I get negative 19.6 over 540 minus 1. Get a common denominator. So it's negative 19.6 over 540 minus 540 over 540. And you get this. I have a quarter c squared here. I'm adding one to it, so one and a quarter or five quarters. That equals zero because I cleared off the right side. I'm now going to multiply everything through by c squared to get it into a more familiar form. And so I have 19.6 over 540 squared minus 
559.6 over 540. C squared plus 5 fourths C to the fourth equals zero. This is a quadratic form. Basically, I can solve for C squared. So this is, if I think of, make a substitution of X is equal to C squared. So this becomes, and I'm gonna change the order around, I get 5 fourths X squared minus 559.6 over 540X plus this 19.6 over 540 squared equals zero. Now I solve for X. So using the quadratic formula, X, we just cosine squared, is equal to 559.6 over 540. So it's negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared. So negative 559.6 over 540 squared. That minus sign is irrelevant there. Minus 4 times a, which is 5 fourths, times c, which is 19.6 over 540 squared. That number right there all over two times a. And the two answers that I got when I worked it out were x equals cosine squared equals 0 0.827763803184 or two solutions 0 0.00127323385 so my cosine, if I take the square root, I get 0.9, so this is the cosine of theta, is 0 0.9098152577722, or 0 0.035682402260097, oh, which translates into two, into four possible solutions. Because when I do the arc cosine in trig, the cosine is basically the x value. You have a unit circle right here. Um, the cosine of the angle is the x value of the radius here is one of that circle. And there's gonna be two angles, first and fourth quadrant, which will produce these cosines. Now your calculator is only going to give you one value. Your calculator is going to give you the first quadrant angle, but there's a fourth quadrant angle also. So theta for the first one is plus or minus 24.520 degrees, and the second one is going to produce plus or minus 87.955 degrees. Now how do you know which is the correct one? Well, there's a certain amount of sense on this, that 87.955, you're practically throwing it straight down. Negative 90 degrees would be like this. Negative 87 is not too far from it. It's not gonna go 60 meters. So through thinking through it, that positive solution is the correct one. But which of these is the correct one? And it actually ends up being the negative. And we can check it quickly enough. Well, we can check it by doing the substitution here. Uh, so if we go with negative 24, so if theta is negative 24.955, yeah, nope, wrong one, 0 0.520 degrees, then my initial vertical velocity, let me pull out the handy dandy calculator, make sure you're in degrees, so 24.52, negative sine 90 times. And so this ends up being negative 37.350977 meters per second. And over here, it's 81.88348. Given this horizontal velocity here, or the horizontal component of the velocity, since it's not changing, acceleration is zero, we can figure out how much time it's in the air. 
So 60 divided by that, and we get the time being 0.73275 seconds. And then we come over here and we can figure out at what time it gets to that position right there. So I know that delta S is equal to VIT plus one half AT squared. So we want to check out at negative 30. Is that equal to negative 37.35351 uh, times 0.73275? plus one half times negative 9.8 times that 0.73275 squared. So we're assuming the negative solution, that, well I happen to know it's right, but we're assuming the negative solution and we'll plug it into it and see if it matches. Does it work out this way? So this right here is negative 27.36887 minus, minus 2.63092 and I get negative 29.9998. So a rounding difference. Now if we assume the positive solution, so theta being positive here, I use the magic of the marker, that angle is positive, then that's positive right there, which means it's being shot up into the air. The time is still the same, but the difference is this is now a positive number, which makes that positive, which now makes this, well, a positive number instead of a negative number. So this, the positive angle cannot be the solution. The alternate way of doing it is with tangent. And so, well, it's recorded so positive you need to, but I'm going to erase and do it a different way. So this was an equation we had earlier. Uh, if we divide everything by cosine squared. Cosine squared divided by cosine squared is one. Sine squared over cosine squared is tangent, so I'm gonna use a capital T for that since I have a lowercase t for time. Uh, that's tangent squared is equal to one over c squared. Uh, that was a mistake I made in class, is I had an extra negative sign in there. So this right here becomes negative 30 is equal to 60 times the, the, the tangent. And just as a reminder, the tangent of theta, I'm letting capital T be the tangent of theta, which is the sine of an angle divided by the cosine of an angle. And check it out on the calculator if you're not familiar with this. But I also did, did in class to show that this is true. Minus 19.6 over 9 times 1 over cosine squared, which is 1 plus tangent squared. So I now have negative 30 is equal to 60t minus 19.6 over 9 minus 19.6 over 9t squared, distributing. It is a quadratic equation, so I need to get it into form to use the quadratic formula. So I'm gonna take everything over to the left side. So this becomes 19.6 divided by nine times squared minus 60 times time plus 19.6 over nine minus 30, which equals zero. Again, added this to both sides, added that to both sides and subtracted that from both sides. So this is 2.17 repeating times squared minus 60t minus, this was 27.83, uh, sorry, 
eight, two, repeating. So my tension is 60 plus or minus the square root of negative 60 squared. Again, the minus sign is going to go away when I square. Minus 4 times 2.17 repeating times 27.82 repeating over 2 times 2.17 repeating. And if you work through that, you have the tangent, which is the tangent of theta, is equal to 60 plus or minus 61.986792 divided by 2 times 2.17 repeating. So the tangent of theta, we have two answers here. 28.007 or negative 0.45615. And that would translate into an angle being 87.955 degrees or negative 24.520 degrees. So if we did the tangent way, which is shorter mathematically, you still have to use a quadratic, the negative pops out of it. But if we use cosine or sine, if we'd done sine, the same thing would have happened, that we would have had to either think through it or do a quick check to, to make sure that whether the positive or negative solution is accurate. Here we don't have the plus or minus issue because tangent is positive in the first and third quadrant, and it's not a third quadrant. First quadrant is this way, from that point of view. Fourth quadrant, second quadrant, third quadrant. Tangent is positive in the first and third quadrant, and the thing is not being shot that way. It is negative in the second and fourth quadrant, and the second quadrant is this way. It is not being shot that way, it, so it must be being shot downwards. So that is what I tried to do in class, but apparently made a careless error, uh, and it just happens. So today is the fourth. Let's see, quiz on chapter two is next Thursday. Master set is, or chapter two is due next Thursday. So we'll put the quiz on three and master set on three, do the 18th. And test 1A on the 25th. So test 1A is chapters one through three, but you know, really two and three. Is it anything from chapter one that we would that would be on the test of stuff that we have used in chapters two and three? Unless you want a significant digits problem. Okay. I have had students think, oh, that'll be easy. Sure, not a problem. And then they regret it. <laughs> when studying for the test, I've done the bit about how I create my tests. All right, when I create my test, I have folders for, for test one or test 1A all together in, in a different folder. And then once I have them all lined up, I sort of close my eyes and run my cursor up and down, and then I click somewhere. And whatever year that test was, that's my starting point. I then highlight that, that test in yellow so I know what the original test was. And I start going through problem by problem and going, well, I really like that problem. I'm going to do something similar to that. Well, that was a really horrible problem. I'm going to toss that one out. Oh, there's something else we talked about in class this semester that we didn't talk about then, so let me put some one of those in. And I watched something on television last night, which inspired me, so let me throw in one of those problems. And that's basically how the tests are created. The master sets are former test problems, so it's almost like forced studying. And that's, well, that's it. So. The old tests should be posted under course documents, I think. You open that up and there's something that says old tests.
And sometimes I write old tests by just going, well, why don't I just reuse this test? But it's never one that I've planned for the future. Sometimes I post all my tests just so that it forces me to create something new. All right, questions before we begin chapter four and actually begin physics. Now the reason why I, I say actually now begin physics is that all the stuff from chapter two and three actually comes from math. The math people define velocity, the math people define acceleration, and everything that we've done, I first learned in math class, I didn't learn in physics. What we're doing now is actually going to introduce the first official physics formula, one that is not based upon definitions, but one that is based upon the experimental data. But we're not there yet. We need to start with the basics of force. And so the first thing is, what is a force? Or would you know it if a force was applied to you? Yes. How would you know it? Okay, uh, so a working definition of a force, actually the definition that I like the best, a push or pull. It's not the official definition, but the official definition is so incredibly vague that uh, I find it useless. But the official definition is an influence that might cause acceleration. Deep, meaningful or not. So push or pull, I think, works as well as any working definition. Now there are some properties of forces, and so did we do the rope in the hallway bit? No. All right, so let's do the rope in the hallway bit. I need to get the rope and the gloves. And I need three volunteers. Whoa, look, what is And that's about the extent of my Spanish. So I hit pause. We've just come back from the rope in the hall demonstration. Already in progress. So at some point, they are pulling up at an angle, which means that part of their force is opposing Amy, but most of their force is still against each other. So if the rope were smaller, then we'd have a steeper angle and you'd get more, more upward force from them, but the longer rope smaller angle, less force upwards. So this brings in a really huge concept here. Direction matters. Therefore, force is a vector quantity. So if on a quiz or test, I ask you for the force, I'm expecting the magnitude and direction. Whether it's in polar form or rectangular form, I usually don't care. So in dealing with forces, we got this general concept, but ultimately what we're going to be doing, and let's start you out with where this, basically all the stuff from chapter 1B is going to be summed up in one pseudo word. Facades. There's an extra S there, yes. Otherwise I would have said one real word. That basically sums up everything we're going to be doing for the next several chapters. F stands for force diagram. That is what we will be spending probably the rest of today doing. A stands for acceleration, direction. These are the steps that you go through when you're analyzing a problem. If you have had physics before, 
which usually is a, a minority of the class uh, for 151. If you had physics before, you might have your own method of doing it. I am teaching a process here, so I, I do ask if you've done some of this, some of the force analysis before, that you sort of open yourselves up to potentially a different way of doing it. CA stands for coordinate axes. So the first thing you do is you figure out what forces are involved, then you figure out which direction the object is going to accelerate, then you define your coordinate system, then you decompose appropriate vectors. Once you have a coordinate system, you'll break up all the forces into that they're parallel or anti-parallel to one of the directions in the, in the axes. Then you'll come up with the equations of motion. The term equations of motion are not related directly to the stuff that we have just done. These are not the cake formulas. Equations of motion is just the term that's used when we plug into Newton's second law. The first S is for substitution. The second S is for solve. Typically you solve for acceleration. One of the reasons why I originally did not have a test 1A and 1B, but just test one, was that usually this whole bit is to find the acceleration, and then that fits very nicely into the motion problems that we do from the first two, or chapters two and three. But it took me some time, but eventually I figured out that uh, it's a lot of material for a first test. So I split it up. So force diagrams, before we do uh, questions on this, before we talk about the forces involved. This is a checklist for forces. Whenever you're given a problem, you're gonna, when you're analyzing forces, there's basically five forces that we were involved with right now. We will add potentially one or two more if, during the course of the semester. But F stands for friction. So this is the force. The G Fox symbol. This is the symbol that I will be using in class. Requirement for that force to exist. Direction of force with respect to WRT, with respect to the pair, I'll explain what the pair is in a moment, and then direction of force with respect to the objects. The symbol I use for friction is what I call the Baroque F, sort of a fancy F like that. Some curls in it. Some textbooks will do a capital F with a subscript with a subscript lowercase f for a friction force. But the requirement in order for friction to exist, there must be desired relative motion. An object does not actually have to move in order for there to be friction. For example, if I push against this table, the table is not moving, but there's friction keeping it from sliding. So the desire is that the, if the floor were frictionless, this table would slide. So that's the desired aspect of it. Relative, it does want to move relative to the object it is touching. The direction of the force with respect to the pair. So let's talk about the pair. There are not a lot of statements in physics that we can make where the word always really is appropriate. There are a lot of them where we can go most of the time, 
or 99% of the time, or as long as we're not dealing with quantum physics, we can get away with that. But there's not a lot of times that the word always works. Forces always come in pairs. Each force in that pair acts on a different object and in opposite directions. As soon as you can internalize that, a lot of more things in, this, in chapters four and five and six will go a lot smoother. So when they're dealing with friction, the direction of the forces with respect to the pair, in other words, I, they come in pairs, so I'm gonna have two friction forces. If I have one, I got two. Uh, and they will always be anti-parallel to each other. And they'll always, in a sense, they're always, all forces are anti-parallel in the pair, but these will be side by side. And with respect to the objects, friction opposes the desired motion, the desired relative motion. And it's parallel to the to the surfaces of contact. Ooh. Can't believe I left this off. Requirement. Contact. Objects have to touch each other in order for there to be friction. We are making the assumption that Jedi powers are not part of this course. I know, because we just wanted, I believe that would fall into one of the religion classes. If any of you have Dr. Cannon, ask him when you're gonna start talking about the Jedi religion. But if you have uh, Mr. Weaver, you can ask him too. I need to double that up, I ask you to ask him. All right, friction. Uh, all these we're gonna go into, once we get the, this basics down, you'll have a checklist and then we'll start actually applying it. T, for tension. Now the symbol I used to use for tension was uh, capital T, but that runs into a problem near the end of the course when, when there's a formula that involves tension and period, and the symbol for period, since period is a time, is a capital T, and so instead of using capital T for tension now, and then at that point going, now we're gonna change it. We'll go ahead and change it now. F with the flow subscript T. Some people on the first uh, test 1B will use a capital T. I know what you're doing at that point. We're not involved in the period yet. The requirement is you need a taut rope chain String. So there's something pulling. The direction with respect to each other, they're, they're always pointing towards each other. The respect to the objects. It is along the line of the taut rope chain, or whatever happens to be pulling.
O stands for other. Uh, I'll talk about other once I've got when, I, when I've done N and G, I will then talk about other. N stands for normal force. The symbol that I use for normal goes back to when I first took physics in high school. The letter that they used in that textbook was the capital Y. That has stuck with me. I will use a capital Y for normal. Textbooks, on the other hand, other than that one I had however many decades ago, I've never seen any other textbook use it. The advantage of capital Y is we don't use it for anything else, which is nice. Disadvantage is there doesn't seem to be much sense, so what does a Y have to do with it other than it's just what I'm using? Some textbooks will use F with a lowercase n. Some will use an F with an uppercase n. Some will just use a lowercase n. And some, ugh, they use a capital N. And I'm going to put the little Mr. Yuck sticker next to that one. Don't use capital N for normal force. Do not. The reason why is that the the international standard unit for force is a Newton, which is symbolized by a capital N. There are enough confusing symbols in physics that you don't have to deal with. You don't have to contend with the normal force equals three Newtons. Or in math class, N is equal to zero. This is, there is something in 152 where we can't help but we do run into something like this, but why add one more that you don't need to use? Please do not use capital N. Requirement, contact. Normal force is only between two objects touching. The pair of normal forces are always pointing away from each other. Normal is a math term. It, it's coming from math. Anyone in here happen to know what normal means? means perpendicular. I'll just write that over here. Normal means perpendicular. Because the normal force is always perpendicular to the surfaces. Example of normal force. I am not falling through the floor at the moment. Because the force pushing up on me. The force pushing up on me with a normal force. It is the force, the name that we give to the force that keeps one object from going through another. So the floor is pushing up on me because that's perpendicular to the surface. We've got a carpet here, my foot here, perpendicular this way. Likewise, because it comes in pairs, I am pushing down on the floor with a normal force. Exact same magnitude. It's pushing up on me with, uh, since COVID, probably about 225 by now. And I'm pushing down on the floor with 225 pounds. G stands for gravitational. Now, if you watch some videos, sometimes I won't use G there. I'll use, instead of F tong, I have F town. And I'll have a W for weight. Generally, I do F town for 110, and I do F tong for 151 and 251. Why? I don't know, but I do it anyway. Now, the reason why I use G, probably more of the reason why I use G for this group and W for that group, is almost everything that they will deal with, the gravitational force is specifically weight. 151 and 251, we do it a little bit more universally. Weight is just a very specific kind of gravitational force. So I'm going to split this into two categories. There is, I use a lowercase w for weight. And 
And then I'll use an F for the lower scale, so for G for the more generalized gravitational force. I'll just put that for generalized. If we're talking about outer space, solar system at that level, or uh, something orbiting the Earth, we're going to be using F sub G. If we're talking about something near the planet or near the moon, then we'll be talking about the weights more specifically. Requirement. F sub G, I just need two masses. There's a generalized, there's a gravitational force between you and every other object in this room. Matter of fact, between you and every object that could, you could possibly see. And some stuff that's unseen, but there's a gravitational force between every person in here. It is tiny. We will ignore that until we get to chapter, I think it's six. But until then, weight, usually spelled with an H in there. The requirement for weight is two masses, one small and one huge mass. And when I say huge, I'm talking planet or moon, sun, something along those lines. The gravitational force you have between you and another person in here, that is not weight. Weight is between you and the Earth. Or if you're on the moon, between you and the moon. Or if you fall into the sun, between you and the sun. The pair of forces are always pointing towards each other. And the direction is toward the center of mass of the other object. So since I'm near the planet Earth, the gravitational force that is acting on me is acting on me toward the center of the Earth. Likewise, I'm pulling up on the Earth with about 225 pounds of force, and it's directed on the Earth towards my center of mass, somewhere around here. All right, questions to hear? Oh, thank you. The symbol that is used is problem specific. F sub A is used a lot because of for applied force, but you know if they give it some other name, then you probably use some symbol related to that. The requirement, a force caused by a source which is unknown or irrelevant. Irrelevant? Irrelevant. I think it's E. It's in the schwa. I assume you'll spell it correctly, whatever the correct spelling is in your notes. The direction of the force with, with respect to the pair, when we do force diagrams, we're going to be doing forces in pairs, with the exception of other. This is the one time where we don't write the other force. The other force exists, but we either don't care or don't know. And when I say don't care, that's not from your own personal uh, sense of philosophy. That is based upon and trying to solve the problem. When we do the force diagrams, we're going to care. But for instance, a textbook usually shows up in a textbook problem. A five Newton force is pushing on a box. You have no idea what's causing the five Newton force. You just know that it exists. So there's five Newtons pushing on the box. Based on this, the box has got to be pushing back with five Newtons on whatever is causing it. But you don't know. 
And matter of fact, what's causing the fight to divorce is irrelevant. So that would be a case of other. And then the direction is problem specific. And I also needed a vowel. Otherwise, we have to. If you'll notice, air resistance is not in here. We will mercifully be ignoring air resistance for almost everything we do in this course. Because air resistance is so incredibly complicated. Presumably, if any of you start getting into designing planes, you will have had air resistance in one, some course up till then. All right, questions are here before we do our first force diagram. All right, we're gonna, I'm gonna do the, the first force diagram just to show you how exciting it is. And then uh, we'll take a small break, come back, and then plow through the rest. But just to get you pumped up for doing force diagrams, and all force diagram thing will end ultimately with a test level problem. Because I will guarantee on test 1B, there will be a complex force diagram problem. So when we go through the force diagrams, we're going to start with the simplest case I know. Box falling. Ground. Box. Now, even though we're ignoring air resistance, I'm going to put little swirls of air here to indicate that it's falling, uh, not to imply that we care that the air has any effect on it. Or there's Limburger cheese in it. All right, so when you're doing a force diagram, on this one it might seem a little bit silly, but it's the process that I'm trying to teach here. First thing you do is you draw the objects. So I'm drawing my box here. And I'm drawing the ground. And then for every single one of these problems, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the two objects. Now, when I draw them, I want to draw them separate so I have room to draw. Do not cram this into tiny little bits, little bits of space. On this one, it might seem a little bit uh, apparent that we have a box in the air. Uh, this is just drawing of the box. This is the drawing of the ground. I would recommend you drawing them in the same orientation in where we're going to do our work as in the original drawing. It will help you, I believe, in the long run. Because when I talk about the direction of forces, if they're in this orientation, it's a whole lot easier to double check that. If I drew the ground up here and the box down here, then the arrows will be pointing in. It won't look like this, even though physically it's happening. We have our checklist. Are there any forces that we can eliminate that we know are not involved? Tension. Why is there no tension? Okay. Tension gone. What else can we get rid of? Friction. Why? There's no contact. Okay. What else can we get rid of? Normal. Why? There's no contact. What else can we get rid of? Other. Why? Because we don't have anything saying that something bad thing will happen. Okay. Isn't this easy? Got rid of 80% of the problem right there. <laughs> gravitational force. Why is there a gravitational force here? The object's falling. Okay, by definition of what falling means. Uh, and? Okay. The fact that we have a planet or whatever it has, or moon. I don't think it's called ground otherwise. All right, so the gravitational force, they point towards each other. So the force that the ground exerts on the box, the ground is pulling down on the box. And we're going to write that out. The ground pulls down on the box. The reason why I'm writing it out like that, because that tells me how I'm going to draw my arrow. I'm going to draw my arrow down on the box. There's 
my box. I'm drawing it down on the box. I need to label it because it's close to the surface of the planet. It's weight. Forces come in pairs. So the box, if the ground is pulling down on the box, the box is pulling up on the ground. If the box weighs 20 pounds, then W is 20 pounds. This W down here, also 20 pounds. This is the weight of the box. Weight of a planet doesn't make a whole lot of sense because there needs to be some other huge object next to it. I guess you could make a claim if the Earth were falling into the sun. But if that were happening, I'm not quite sure this stuff matters. The first force diagram. There are a couple of extra comments I want to make about it before we break. Any questions about this at the moment? If you look up force diagrams on some other source, I have not found any other source that actually does it the way I do it. Uh, the way I do it comes from some of my engineering background. You will tend to see something called the free body diagram. Textbooks generally talk about the free body diagram instead of the force diagram. The free body diagram is they take the object and they reduce it to a single point. So that would be the box, and that would be the ground. You have weight acting down and weight acting up. The free body diagram is typically the way that it's done. It, in some sense, it makes life just slightly better uh, when you're trying to figure out the direction of forces. So you're not having, I mean, if I drew an elephant and I had forces up over here and up over here and down over here and down over here, it's less concentrated. You just have to know, all right, think of the elephant as an object. The disadvantage of this is this works fine until you get the rotational motion. Once you get the rotational motion, where the force is applied matters. And so I start out with drawing the object itself because at some point when we get to chapters, I think it's chapter nine, then it matters where the force is applied and we need to draw out the whole object. So I'm just starting now with drawing out the, the full object as opposed to just drawing out a, a dot. And the last point I want to make is what I'm going to call rookie mistake number one. Drawing them in the wrong direction. And this deserves big old Mr. Yuck. I think there's a thumb. You are drawing forces on the receiver of the force, not on the source. Draw forces, force arrows, on receiver, not source. All forces have a, a source and a, re and a receiver. This force right here that is down on the box. The source is the earth, the receiver is the box. This force right here, the source is the box, the receiver is the ground. So you're drawing forces on what is receiving the force, not on what's causing the force. And on that note, let's take a small little break here. Get pumped up, because what we're gonna do when you come back, box on ground. Yeah. Lots on ground. You heard right. All right. First step, we draw the two objects. Now, I did not have the hash marks over there before, uh, and I have put them in now. Uh, the hash marks. That, that, that slight tilt like that generally indicate an object that we're considering fixed. That we assume that the ground is not moving. Um, 
When I draw the box up here, I am not saying that the box is in the air now. All I've done is just draw a box. And I've given myself some space here. So let's go through our checklist. What can we eliminate? Why? Uh, because the box is not sliding across the surface. Uh, we can do slightly better than that. If it were sliding, then definitely there is friction, but it doesn't have to slide to have friction. It's not Sorry? It's not touching anything? Uh, no, it is. It's sitting on the ground. It's at rest. Pardon? It's at rest. Uh, being at rest doesn't mean there's no friction. Friction rest? That, is there a definite from at rest? Uh, here's an example of an object at rest where friction is acting on it. There's friction acting on almost every object on this table. I'll say every object on this table is friction acting on it. But they're not, they're not moving. <clears throat> so what is the key here about why there's no friction acting on the box? Does it need to be anti-parallel? No, that's not the requirement. We're not at an angle. Pardon? We're not at an angle. Ultimately, yes. That's it. There's no desired motion. If the ground were frictionless, which way would this thing slide? Now, there, if it were table were frictionless, everything would slide off down that way. There is a desired way it wants to go. Now, I do want to point out, I am not playing the game of, that was at a one degree angle, I can't believe you missed that. I'm not playing that game. If it's at an angle, I will draw, hopefully, very clearly that it's at an angle. If I draw something like this, I'm freehanding it, if it looks like it's supposed to be level, it's probably supposed to be level. On a quiz or a test, ask if you're not sure. It has not been an issue in the past of students going, I thought that was at an angle. And it's like, no, that, if it looks like it's supposed to be level, it's level. All right, so there's no desired motion. All right, so friction's out. Friction. Why not? Okay. Why no other? Anything else? Uh, gravitational. Well, no, never mind. There is normal and there is gravitational. Indeed, there are. Why is there a normal force here? Because there's two objects. If the ground were not there, the box would fall. If there's suddenly there was a cave in, the box would fall. So there's got to be something holding it up. So there's a normal force. So the ground's holding the box up. The ground is pushing up on the box. So I draw my normal force up on the box. But forces come in pairs. So where's the other part of that pair? Since I have only two objects that are touching each other, that I've got only one place where there's contact, normal force is done. And now the weight. Greg, you were saying that there was weight? Because uh, uh, you were first sounded like you were going to eliminate it, then you changed your mind. Yeah, I was going to eliminate it because it was because it's pointing away from each other. <clears throat> Oh, well, I already kindled that. Gravitational forces should point towards each other. We haven't done. How do we know that there should be weight involved here? Box weight, so. Sorry. I, one more time. It's there. You said it's there? Uh, I don't know if it's, it's just sitting on the ground right now. There's a small and huge mass. And, and there's one thing I forgot to add small and huge mass near each other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a box sitting near the ground or on the ground here, whatever, whether it's Earth, Mars, whatever it happens to be. There is a weight there because it's being pulled towards it. Likewise. 
And since I have only one small object near this large object, I'm done with the rest of time. Rookie mistake number two. At some point, I'll codify these, so you'll get other videos. I might be doing the rookie mistakes in a different order. Rookie mistake number two, because this is the second one I'm talking about. No man's land. I have seen this way too many times. And now I'm supposed to guess what they were thinking. The force acts on an object. Please draw the arrows on an object. Now there are times when I have seen, seen it like that, where they're technically drawn in no man's land, they're not on the box, but I think I have a pretty good idea what this person meant. So sometimes just draw a line there to differentiate. But that one, I have seen that, and I have no idea what they're thinking. Unless they're doing a Hail Mary, it's also a possibility. Questions to hear. All right, so now we're going to do the almost as exciting, perhaps even more exciting, box on box on ground. But this one, I'm actually we're going to have a direct application for this one. So after we've done box on box on ground, uh, we I will do a, a an analogy and then ask a question that most people missed the first time around. Box on box on ground. Call this A and B. I have two boxes, I should have given the name. As opposed to box. So, what's the first step? Draw it. Separately? Yes. All right. Can we eliminate anything? Friction, tension, and other. All right. For the exact same reasons as before. Uh, let's do weight first. I think weight's easier. Is there? There is weight involved. What? Which? Tell me uh, which way a weight vector is acting on what object. Same as four on B in the ground. All right. So. Down on B? Yeah. Up on the ground? Yeah. And then one up on B and down on A. Weight? What's the requirement for weight? Yeah, near each other. Again, I'm going to regret not including that earlier. So are you claiming that B is a huge object, planet size? No. Then there's not a weight between A and B. Now, to make matters more confusing, there is a gravitational force between them, but it's so incredibly tiny that we will ignore it for your sanity. Because if we include that weight right there, then we also would have to include the weight between the left side of box A and the right side of box A. Oh, well, as a matter of fact, we're not about the upper quadrant of A against the other three quadrants and so forth, and then you keep breaking it down farther and farther. So we will ignore those tiny little forces. So between A and the ground? Yep. Acting which way on A? Down. And which way on the ground? Up. Now, I've deliberately made a mistake here. This is, we're going to call this rookie mistake number three <laughs> that I have right here. What mistake is there? Why would I take off points if you did your weights like that? There's two. The weight lines for the ground going upwards. Therefore? Therefore, that would be implying like double the. Uh, I'm not too sure. Oh, you're almost there. It sounded like it. Do you need to know, do we need to show you which weight we're correlating with A or B? Yes, we do. We need to differentiate between the two. That's the way from A. That's the way from B. 
If I have more than one force, of a, or more than one pair of a certain type of the F, F tone, I need subscripts. So the rookie mistake, no subscripts. Or subscripts, apparently. Subscripts. What I tend to do on the test, on the complex force diagram problem, is that if somebody decides they're not going to bother with any subscripts whatsoever, well, whatsoever, they're just going to have a whole bunch of weights going down, all marked W. I give them credit for the first one, and then I take off for everyone after that. All right. Uh, I have only two small objects there. I've got two pairs of weights, so done. Normal force. There was a claim that there was a normal force here. Um, the normal force is scaling it's going up on box A. Okay, and? And then there's a normal force going up on box B. And then there's a normal force going downwards on the ground. Which one is that? Uh, that one would be B. Is there another one? And they come in pairs. We have an odd number there. So a, a. Acting down on the ground. Would be some mistake number four. B. It requires contact. A is not touching the ground. There's no normal force there. So rookie mistake number four. Normal force when. There is no contact. I've seen it way too many times. And then some students get it confused in their head and then they only do weight when there's contact. Weight does, weight does not require contact. One time it was called action at a distance. Normal force requires contact. So A and B touch each other, so I got my pair there. B and the ground touch each other, so I got my pair there. Look at mistake number five, which I could have done earlier. Not enough room. In other words, they do the force, they don't bother rewriting the stuff. They do it right here, and they just go, well, I got a weight acting down here, weight of D, and I got a weight of B here. I got a normal force acting on B here, and I got a normal force acting on the ground there, and I got a weight of A there, so, and uh, let's see, I got a weight of A here. I guess this would be Y of A, and then I got Y of A there. Extra big one over here. If paper is a precious commodity for you, I will I'll get you paper. Take the root. Use it. On the complex force diagram, I will to give you the, the diagram already split apart. Uh, just because I don't want you to have to worry about, do I consider this as a separate object or is, is this part of that object? So I, I'll do that part for you. Knowing how to break it up with experience becomes a little bit more obvious, but uh, just starting out, it's not necessarily obvious how you're supposed to break the diagram apart. Here, I got three objects, I draw three things. All right, questions are here because I'm about to apply this to real life. That's a scale you're standing on, not a surfboard. <laughs> you're standing on your bathroom scale in the morning. For the sake of simplicity, let's just assume that the scale is on the ground and I don't have to bring in a building into this diagram. So I draw my three objects. I got my noseless person. I have my scale. And I have the ground. My force diagram should look pretty much like that, except I have a lot of different subscripts. So I got weight of person acting down here, so I'm gonna use P for person. 
I have a weight of the scale, weight of scale. I have a normal force acting up on the person. And then I have normal force acting up on the scale. And so I got two acting on the top one, three on the middle one. There's a top arrow there. And three on the ground. Okay. It is direct analogy of box on box on ground. It's just instead of box, first box we have person, or instead of box B we have scale. All right, so here's the question. What is the scale measure? When you stand on your vacuum scale, what is it measuring? Weight. And that is the most common mistake. Yes. Who? No. If we're measuring mass, it would be called a balance, by the way. The reason why it's not weight, you're talking about the weight of the person, I assume. Sure. Weight of the person is not acting anywhere on the scale. It's not measuring the weight of the person. We infer the weight of the person because of certain situations, but it is not measuring the weight. What is it actually measuring? No, at this, uh, where everything is, the gravitational force is, is a weight. It's not measuring gravitational force. It's a force. Oh, it is measuring a force. I will agree with that. With one. Vacuum scale. Part of my inheritance. Oh, yeah. I can't believe my brother didn't want this. Of course, I abuse it so much in here by dropping things on it. It doesn't really measure things particularly well, but it works well enough. If I stand on it, do I have an influence on the scale? Yes. yes. All right, so I'm exerting some force on it. What force am I exerting on the scale? Think about the force diagram. What force is the person exerting on the scale? Yes. The scale measures the normal force I exert on it. I'm assuming, of course, analog scales are probably rarer now than they used to be. But I'm hoping you've stood on an analog scale. What happens when you bounce up and down? Yeah, your weight's not fluctuating. Otherwise, you've got very quick weight gain and weight loss. I might go see a doctor. It's measuring the normal force you are put exerting on this. Now, if person is in equilibrium, Equilibrium is basically three definitions. The total force equals zero, or the acceleration equals zero, or the change in velocity equals zero. If one of these is true, the other two are also true. If the person is in equilibrium, then the magnitude of the normal force equals the magnitude of the weight. If the person's in equilibrium, then the forces up equal the forces down, and so that would equal that. That's why we generally consider it's measuring your weight, but it's only measuring your weight if you are in equilibrium. So, right now, am I in equilibrium? Why do you say so? Because we have no acceleration or velocity. But I can't it's not a question of whether a velocity is or whether my velocity is changing. Uh, what is the first one with that? Yeah. Uh, the total force. The total force equals zero with uh, students. All right. So, am I accelerating right now? For the sake, for practical purposes, I, I'm, in, I'm in equilibrium. However, I'm on the surface of the, surface of the Earth, aren't I? Yes. Is the Earth spinning? 
If the earth is spinning, is my velocity maintaining the same direction? As I go around the earth, is my velocity going staying in the same direction? So we do have some acceleration because of change in direction. It's called centripetal acceleration. So scales actually measure the normal force. Uh, there is a slight discrepancy between your weight and the normal force because we are on the earth spinning around. And depending upon time of day, uh, the earth's also going around the sun, the sun's going around the center of the, of the Milky Way, Milky Way's traveling. Uh, that might be constant velocity, I don't know. Kind of difficult to measure the speed of the galaxy you're in. So a practical application of justifying why scales actually measure normal force, they don't actually measure weight. However, close enough if you're if not accelerating. Uh, the acceleration versus moving, it, let's, just, let's assume that the Earth is still, that we're referencing that. If you take a scale and do an elevator, and of course I've done this because I teach physics, but if you ever get an opportunity to take an analog scale into an elevator, you'll notice when it first starts out, so you, you'll stand there, it should measure something that what we, you'll generally consider your weight. When it starts to move, it's going from still to moving, you're going to accelerate, so it's going to change. It's either going to weigh more or less, depending on if you're going up or down. And then when the elevator reaches its steady velocity, it should go back to normal. And then when you stop, it should flip whichever the other way is, depending upon if you're, stop, if you're stopping going up or stopping going down. We'll get to that in more detail later. Any questions about box on box on ground or person on scale on ground? And then one that you will be doing, you will at some point do in your sleep. Box on ramp. I am making the ramp part of the ground. If you need a visual, uh, just imagine like the hill over there. That's outside the window. There's a hill there. That's the hill. And that's the box. So the ramp and the ground are part of the same thing. So when I draw, draw the diagram, I'm going to draw the box. And then I'm going to draw the ramp. I'll give myself a little bit more space there. My recommendation is that when you draw the objects as the separate items, draw them in the same orientation as they were originally. So the box is at a, a tilt, the box is at a tilt. I've seen a number of students who will straighten out the box and just draw it uh, so that it's parallel, the sides are parallel or perpendicular to the ground. The students who do that tend to run into trouble when they start to write down the normal force. Some compensate for it and some just, they get so stuck in a, a groove and messing them up. All right, can we eliminate anything? That's the easy one. <clears throat> which weight is weight acting? Which way is weight acting on the box? Uh, directly downward. Where's the center of the earth? Or a different way. If the ramp suddenly disappeared, which way would the box go? Straight down. Matter of fact. Down is defined by the direction that the gravitational pull is. It is straight down. Now this weight is coming from the Earth. The Earth is the source of this force right here. So the box is exerting a force on the ground. 
It really does not matter where you draw the up arrow on the ground. Some people like to do it on the ramp because that's directly underneath, but you know, I can just as easily do the weight right there. It's being it's pulling on the entire planet. Matter of fact, if I got up on this table and I jumped off the table onto the ground, you will see me fall over whatever distance that is. That far. But the ground, I'm pulling on the ground as I'm falling, so the ground's coming up to meet me. Not very far. We've done the, cal done the calculation, and it's about the size of a nucleus of an atom. That's how much the Earth comes up. But I am pulling up on it. Just because we exert the same force on each other doesn't mean we have the same reaction to that force. Um, theoretically speaking, I know this is kind of off topic, but if everyone in an area jumped up, like all the humans on Earth jumped up, how much would that pull up on that Earth? Do you think it has some It would have an almost infinitesimal effect on it. Uh, when I fourth or fifth grade, I got a book of strange and useless facts. And one of them said that if every person in China jumped up and down at the same time, it would create a tidal wave large enough to drown the US. I've wondered about that. And then more recently, there's uh, someone who does, uh, I think it's an internet column, also had a book called What If, where he talked about what if everyone jumped up and down. And his, his claim was that there'd be absolutely no effect. The Earth would never notice because we are so small compared to it. And then went into the more interesting fact is, suppose we all gathered, everyone in the world gathered in, say, Rhode Island to do this. The more interesting part was getting away. How many people would die? Because how long would it take if you gathered seven billion people together, the person in the middle, how long would it take before that person could move? And then it got into the logistics and so forth. It was an interesting analysis. Serious answers to ridiculous questions. That was the subtitle, I believe. But if you have a chance to see that, there's also, there was a posting in Almond on the, I think it was the third floor, about relativistic baseball. If you threw a baseball near the speed of light, what would happen? But that was also the same guy who did that. <coughs> uh, by the way, if you threw a baseball near the speed of light, it would create a nuclear blast that would destroy the city. Anyway, please don't try that at home. <laughs> All right, so we have only one small object besides the Earth uh, and the Earth, so gravitational force is done. Uh, let's do normal next, or uh, you know, either one. Normal or friction, which one do we do next? All right, hard normal. Which way is normal acting on the box? Perpendicular. To? To the box. To the what? Um, Perpendicular to the box. Like that? No, like that way. Yes. Not up? No, not up. Don't forget normal means perpendicular. Absolutely. And this is working mistake number six. What are we up to? Working mistake number six. Drawing normal force up automatically. A number of students who've just, because so many problems we deal with normal forces acting up, they get into a habit of always drawing it up. No, it's not always up. In this case right here, the normal force is indeed perpendicular to the ramp. And the, but they come in pairs. Where's the other one? Acting which way? Oh, that's us. Down towards Down towards the earth. That the oh, hand oh, that's 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 there. <laughs> so right. get down is that way. Yeah. Turn it down to the And so, 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 so I have only two objects and they're touching there. Normal force done. And now friction. And there's the requirement I had for friction is that there has to be contact. The requirement I had for normal force is that there's contact. I can be slightly more explicit than that. A requirement for friction is that there is a normal force. So 
wherever there's a normal force pair, that's where you would go, huh, is there friction there? If you have friction at a place of contact and no normal force, then something's wrong. Friction requires normal force. Normal force does not require friction as demonstrated in the first three force diagrams we did. But, all right, so which way is friction acting on the box? Would it? Craig's nodding yes. Which way does the box want to go relative to the ramp? And friction opposes that. It indeed is up the ramp. And then which way is it acting on the ramp? Don't go with your hand gestures, Craig. <laughs> Although sometimes I can't understand hand, hand directions because occasionally I'm asking which way and they'll pull out the pen or the pin's in their hand and they'll do it this way. I'm like, all right, so which way is it going? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sure I've done it too, so. Uh, done, there we go. Box on ramp is a classic physics type problem. And so when we do the full facades, uh, one of the first examples we'll do will be box on ramp. All right, so at this point we've included friction, we've done everything except for tension, so let's bring tension into it. And at this point, uh, box on cliff, pulled by rope. At this point, the titles start becoming too long. Need to define a couple of things here, so while people are putting their artistic touch to what I've drawn. When we talk about what an ideal rope and an ideal pulley are. Ideal rope has three major characteristics. Uh, Ms. Sassen, if you've had her before, uh, the other physics instructor, full-time physics instructor, calls it the magic rope. But there are several three major characteristics. It is stretchless. In other words, whatever length of the rope is, it is that length. It will not, there's no elasticity to it whatsoever. It is massless. It is frictionless. That last characteristic, the frictionless bit, we will remove when we get to chapter, I think it's nine, nine or 10, we, we will give it friction. For the sake of this course, I don't think I've ever done a case where we've added mass to it. 251, we might add mass to it, but, and then the stretchless is, uh, unless we were doing a bungee jumping problem, stretchless is something that will be maintained. Probably at that point, I would not go on a rope. We're doing bungee jumping. The ideal pulley is massless. Frictionless at bearings. And frictionless at edge. Whatever you want to do. The place where the rope's touching. <clears throat> We will, at some point, chapter 9 or 10, we will give it mass and we will add friction. Uh, for 151, we might or might not add friction at the bearings, but definitely friction on the edge. In other words, at some point, the rope is going to be pulling on the pulley as it turns. We're not there yet, though. So right now, it's an ideal pulley, an ideal rope. On the complex, on the complex problem, if you look at old tests, you'll notice that Sometimes I actually say ideal rope and sometimes I don't. I, I suspect the older ones, I'm less likely to actually state it. If you're not sure on a test or quiz, please ask. Because the pulley is actually not gonna turn here, there's nothing to cause it to turn because we're dealing with a frictionless rope, a frictionless uh, pulley. The pulley is just part of the cliff. So when I draw my diagram here, I got my box A, I got my box B, I've got my cliff with pulley attached and I've got the rope. I got four different parts here.
on the complex test problem, on the complex force diagram problem on the test, uh, when I separate it, I would do something like this and I have the pulley attached to the cliff. I have students who will still do forces between the pulley and the ground. If I draw it like this, I'm saying that the pulley and the ground are part of the same thing. You don't need to talk about the forces between the pulley and the ground. That is known as an internal force. We're not doing internal forces. If we did, you would never finish a problem because there are, well, for, for every gram of hydrogen, you've got uh, on the order of 10 to the 23rd particles and the force between each of them it would drive you insane trying to draw all the internal forces. All right, get the checklist. Tom. Can we eliminate anything? Can't get rid of other. And that's about it. So, yeah, it's, it's not as nice as a lot of the other ones we did where we eliminated most of them, but. Worth answering. Uh, gravitational force, I think that's the simplest. So let's start with gravitational force. Acting on what, where, and in which direction? One plus A and B downwards. Uh, let's do a pair at a time. So like this one acting down on A. And then the ground's acting up on A. Oh. I'm going to check that wording there. It is not acting up on A. What's the other part of that pair? Acting which way? It's acting up on the ground. So down on A, up on the ground. Now I suspect you would have drawn it that way, but the way you worded it was, was backwards. All right, and then you also said down on B? Yes. And the other part of that pair? The ground at the bottom of B. All right, so that's where, which way? Up. Okay. And at this point, you might consider it obvious that it's up, but again, having done this enough, trying to get people used to the language. All right, so uh, those are the only two small objects. Oh, why does the rope not have a weight attached to it? Perfect and, rope. Pardon? Just perfect rope. Ideal rope. And magic all at the same time. <laughs> if if you did put a weight on the rope, I on the, the complex force diagram problem, I don't take off for it. It's just I generally circle it right IGN for ignore. Alright, so uh, gravitational force done. Any normal forces here? We didn't eliminate it, so we, either we made a mistake earlier or there isn't one with at least one bear. Matter of fact, there are two bears. Uh, there's a normal force on box A going upward. And then the pair is the normal force going downwards on the ground. Okay. One down. There's uh, another pair. The normal force on the rope going down. Not down. Oh, up. Straight up. Perpendicular to the cliff at the edge. So sort of like that? Yes. Okay. All right. So the actual direction, I didn't give you enough information for you to find the exact direction of the normal force here. I know that the rope touches the pulley at this point to here. So all along there. So the, the net normal force is somewhere in that range. And so I would typically draw it up at an angle like that. But there, there's a little bit of flexibility there. Not a whole lot, but there's a little bit of flexibility. So Y sub, I'll just use R for rope. And then uh, so 
was there any other contact going on? Nose to the boxes. That's where we're going to put tension. Okay. So let's do. Uh, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I want to do friction next, then tension, since that's the new one. All right. So friction. Which way is friction acting on what? The ground friction is going to work to the cross base. Right. So we'll draw this arrow where? Uh, for the ground left. So it's left on the ground? Yes. And then right on the box? Yes. So the friction is dragging box A towards the cliff? Oh, no. no. It's the opposite way. Box A. The A is going to the left. All right, so again, the big question is, if it were frictionless, which way is box A going to move? Box A is going to move that way. Friction hates that. It's acting back. Any other frictions? The only other place there could possibly be friction is where this normal force pair is, but the rope is only frictionless, so no friction there. All right, friction done. All right, so now it's in. The reason why we ignore whether it's normal force where the box is touching the, the rope. We really don't know how the rope is attached to the box. So if this hand is the box and this is the rope, is it sort of wedged in there, in which case that's a friction force holding it in, or do I have an eye hook here and it's wrapped around the eye hook, in which case it's a normal force? I'm not telling you how it's connected. I'm just saying that it is connected. And so that's what we're calling tension. Some physics instructors will make the claim that tension doesn't really exist because it's really one of the other forces. And, and yeah, I, it's much simpler just to say, well, I don't know what it is, so I'm going to call it tension, than to try to get into the, the picky unit aspect of how is it actually connected? So, use green yet. If the rope were cut, so right here, if the rope's cut, what's going to happen to me? Therefore, Therefore, which way was tension acting on the box? It was keeping it up, keeping it up. So tension is acting up here, and it's pulling down on the rope. Tension is always pulling at the ends of the rope. I have another end of the rope, so I've got a tension over there too. Because box A is moving to the right. If I cut that rope, box A is not moving that way. So the rope must have been pulling on it that way. And then, what about subscripts? Do I need a sub, a sub uh, are these the same tension? All right, are these the same tension? Yes. Okay, they are, those are the same, those are the same. So do we need subscripts? Yes. Is it an ideal rope? If it's an ideal rope, then this magnitude of tension happens to be the same as that. If that rope is not ideal, then these tensions are not the same, and so you would need a subscript for that pair and a subscript for that pair. On the test, there's going to be at least one of you who puts the subscripts in there, and that's fine. There's no penalty for it. The, those are, that's appropriate to put them there and there. If it's an ideal rope, it's not necessary unless you have a second rope. Each, if I have two ropes, then I'm going to have to use subscripts somewhere. And tension, done. Each rope is going to have a tension, a pair of tensions at each end. So. One more force diagram to do before we get to the test level problem of man pulling boy on a sled. I call it that. Actually, man pulling the sled when the boy happens to be on the sled, but that just gets wordy. I'm going to set it up. 
the rope on the right hand side I deliberately made parallel to the ground. The rope on the left hand side I deliberately made not parallel to the ground. And that is just going to be the, the teaser to that you'll be thinking about for the next week. <laughs> and that's all for the rest of the weekend. <laughs>